do you believe there's a possibility or the technology for one or one day, you know, your mom's no longer here, your dad's no longer here, will you be able to talk to them and have a conversation with them? You think there's a possibility? Like reverse that? time travel? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's probably prohibited. So, you know, Stephen Hawking worried about this a lot. Um, he actually held famously a party. Uh, it was like in 2010, 2006, something like this. He had a party, he didn't tell anybody about it. He had a party just by himself and it was the time travelers party for time travelers to come to. He really did it. And he, he just sat there in this hall waiting for time travelers to come. No one came. And then it was kind of a joke. But, and then he advertised it after the fact. So, so after it happened, he said, by the way, I'm going to have a time travel party on this date. And people in the future will be able to you know, recognize the date location, here it all is, and go back to that point and visit me. And of course, no one came. And you know, he was kind of being a bit tongue in cheek with that. I don't think it was intended as a real scientific experiment. But I think his point was like, how come we don't see any time travelers? Like if this was a legit thing, you'd think we'd see time travelers mm -hmm. or evidence of it by now. Um, and so his argument was that the universe actually prohibits it because it creates paradoxes. So you, maybe you've heard of like the grandfather paradox mm -hmm. where you can go back in time, kill your granddad, and then that means that you don't exist. So if you don't exist, you can't go back and kill your granddad. So if you don't go back and kill your granddad, you do exist. And so you get this kind of cycle of Ill illogic happening, of, of non-logical, non-Sakita um, behavior. And so he argued that because of these paradoxes, the universe just prohibits it. So it's called Hawking's chronology protection conjecture. Chronology protection conjecture. And it's a conjecture because he can't prove it. So it's not like he can write down a mathematical theorem and prove that this must be so. But he argues that the universe just really doesn't make sense if reverse time travel happens. And so whenever you think of a mechanism by which time travel might happen, um, the universe will always destroy it. So an instance might be wormholes, which are in interstellar. So imagine you have two wormholes um, and you can form them. There's no time travel involved. I have one here, one here, no, tra no time travel involved. But I could always take one and accelerate it close to the speed of light and then come back to the same point. And now it would be time displaced, right? Because when you accelerate close to the speed of light, that causes time dilation. So now I do have a time machine. Whenever you have wormholes, you can always form a time machine. So now the problem is, uh, you know, this would seem to violate the Hawking's idea, assuming these wormholes are possible in the first place. And so Hawking actually showed, and others have shown, that these things, it's kind of like having a microphone next to a loudspeaker. What happens when you do that? What do you hear? What's the sound you get? Boom. Yeah, you yeah. get this like feedback, yeah. right? This, like this super loud squeak, it's mm -hmm. very horrible to hear. And the same thing will happen with these wormholes. So imagine you have a particle of light and it will travel through one and it will come back in time through the other. And now there's two versions of that particle. Then they both travel through. Now there's three versions. Now there's four versions. And so it's like copying itself, just like feedback with a microphone and a loudspeaker. You get a feedback effect of the, of the particle. And before you know it, you get an infinite number of these particles collected between the two wormholes, which destabilizes the two wormholes gravitationally. And so now they both collapse. And so at the instant you form the two wormholes, they immediately collapse due to this effect. They can't, so you can, in principle, make them, but you can't have them for any length of time because <laughs> they immediately collapse. So whenever you come up with an idea for a time travel machine, Hawking argues that some mechanism, and that's an example of it, will always, the universe will screw Sorry. it over for you because it's too clever to stop you from doing that. The universe is too clever to stop you from doing that. I mean, not literally, they're not really an agency, but... Oh, no, I it, get what yeah. you're saying. I don't think it's going to be like uh, Mossad or CIA mm -hmm. coming and saying, hey, <laughs> Rob, stop it, don't play with time. <laughs> it's, uh, it's against protocol. Very in have you ever played a Ouija board? No. Never have? No. Do you know what it is? It's like uh, talking to dead people type yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I mean, I'm not... I've actually always said, I would. my kids often ask me about ghosts, like, do you believe in ghosts, Dad? And I always say, look, if I detected ghosts... You know, I would love it. I'd be excited because it would prove that when you die, there's something else afterwards. It would be incredibly scientifically interesting to know that there was something else that happens beyond the biological when you die. Of course, there's no, in my book, you know, compelling evidence for this phenomenon, but I would always be excited by the possibility of it being true. So you don't believe in Sam Wheat? Sam Wheat? Or Molly Jensen. I don't know what those are. You ever seen the movie Ghost with Patrick Swayze? Oh, yeah, yeah. Are those the characters? Yeah, Rob, you've never seen the movie <laughs> Ghost? 
I mean, it's it's you can't tell me it's not real. I mean, that right there's Molly and there is Sam. <laughs> proof, okay, proof and, and is in that film. You, you, this is this is a movie based what on a want? based on true story on what happened with this movie. No, nah, I mean, listen, Ouija boards, we don't touch that kind of stuff. I remember as a kid, you know, we had some friends that wanted to play with it. I'm like, just get that thing away from me as much as possible. Let me talk to you about another thing. Space nuclear, right? Space nuclear explosions that they do, right? I think they did one in 58 or 62. I don't know which one. It was a Starfish uh, Prime uh, high-altitude nuclear test conducted yeah. by U.S., a joint effort that they did this in 62. And, you know, what is it going to do? What are the side effects are going to be? So, one... Why do they do it? Two, what did we learn from actually having a nuclear test in space? I think one of the most interesting, you know, interesting, like weaponization prospects of this thing is EMPs, so electromagnetic pulses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when these nukes go off, they, they generate these electromagnetic shock waves that travel through the atmosphere and can basically short circuit electronics. By detonating it high in the atmosphere, you basically give yourself the largest range possible to hit the surface and create that effect. So I think most of the time people talk about the use of such weapons, it's it's not so much that you're trying to create damage on the ground through the fireball, but that you're trying to basically do a cyber attack essentially and remove all the electronic capability of the adversary. Got it. So if the enemy has certain technology out there or satellites out there that they're watching or they're, you know, they're doing what they're doing, this is my way of getting rid of their technology that the enemy is using yeah i mean there are ways to protect against it though so there's like a, a simple thing that's called like a faraday cage where it's like a chicken wire mesh type thing you can even buy i think you can buy like wallets and bags that have this like lined in the bag mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, of course you can get no cell service if you put your phone in one of these bags because it blocks all cell phone signals or radio signals mm -hmm. but it protects your device from potentially an emp um, so if you're, you know, a real doomsday and you, you worry about this kind of thing, you might want to put your precious electronics. Maybe if you have a load of Bitcoin in a hardware wallet, for instance, that might be a good instance of like a backup. Put it in the basement and put it in one of these Faraday cage pockets or, you know, sachets or something to protect it. So it's a, you know, it can be, you know, like all weapons, there's always a way around it, you know. So this this isn't a foolproof way, but it would be pretty uh pretty damaging to to the infrastructure if somebody detonates one of these things uh what do you what are you most excited about like with all the projects that you're working on what are you most excited about you know i've just recently got tenure at columbia so now congrats yeah, yeah thank you and the i think one of the objectives of tenure is that it gives you the freedom to really just go for like whatever you want like just st you know, take the gloves off and find the things that you're really passionate about and don't worry so much about grants and the things we've been talking about, like looking for alien life in the universe, have fascinated me for a long time. And I've written papers on that topic, um, but I really want to push harder on that. And um, also how to get to the stars. We have a project in my team right now. I'm not going to talk about it too much because it's still kind of top secret, but we do have a, it's kind of ridiculous to say out loud, but an interstellar propulsion system that we're designing in my team. And uh, that's the sure. kind of thing that I would never do unless I was tenured. Um, but me and a couple of engineering students have been working on this project for the last year or two. And uh, we think we have something interesting to contribute to that idea. I don't know if it will work out. You know, I'm an astrophysicist, not an engineer. But we have an interesting design that nobody's ever thought of that we think could be better than some of the alternatives that people propose, like the Starshot thing we've talked about so far. So that's the kind of stuff I get buzzed about is, you know, I had this dream as a kid, looking up at the stars, wondering who else was out there and wanting to touch the stars. And I want to do whatever I can in my life to try to advance humanity's mission to try and achieve that. I think I'm not going to solve it. I'm one person, but maybe I can add a small piece to the puzzle and we'll get there together. I love it. You seem very sincere about it. I've, I've enjoyed listening to you. This has actually been a uh, very interesting podcast. I am going to lobby for you to be able to raise $250 billion so we can find <laughs> out what the hell is going on out there with yeah. this technology. I'm surprised other people haven't brought it up yet because if a president like John F. Kennedy was to sell a vision like that, I think a lot of people would buy into it. And uh, if we really are concerned about the future, this could be one day, one way that we can find out for a fact what's really taking place. Yeah. By the way, if there's anything you would want people to go look at, would it be mainly your YouTube channel or is there a website or a project that you want them to look at? 
Yeah, so you can check out my YouTube channel. That's uh, Cool Worlds Lab, at Cool Worlds Lab on YouTube. Uh, we also have the Cool Worlds Podcast, uh, so just at Cool Worlds Podcast. Um, and there are mostly interviewing scientists and astronomers, physicists, uh, you know, thinkers about our place in the universe. Um, and then on top of that, there's the website coolworldslab.com where we have kind of a unique funding model for my team. So we do the usual thing of applying for NASA grants and federal grants, things like this. But we also get a lot of people who just donate money to my team out of their own pocket. It could be as much of a price of a coffee per month that they're giving. So if you hit support at the top of the, of the top of this page, you can become a donor to my research lab, the Cool Words team. And uh, through this, through these donations, we can do stuff that you can't do through conventional federal funding. So like the interstellar propulsion system, there's no way, no way I can write to NASA and say, give me, you know, $100,000 to start working on just a preliminary idea for this, just to get the ball rolling. They're just going to laugh you out the room. But thanks to, you know, support from people who have a bit of vision. That and is think, so cool. You know, this is worth maybe investing in. The so, Illuminati. <laughs> the Illuminati right at the top there, yeah. Those are our, our top donors. Um, yeah, and this money goes, you know, through to Colombia. It doesn't go into my pocket. I think that's the advantage of this. This is tax deductible. It, I don't see this money. It's all used for research purely research money so you have the, the this is not like a patreon where you know people are that's using cool. this for salary this is just research funds that's cool so if you want to support real research this is the way to do it rob let's put this link below in the description and the chat for people to go check out and support and uh again i've enjoyed spending this time with you man i appreciate you coming out yeah, thank you so too. much thank man. this was great you. thank you in these uncertain times, if there's anything we need is we need people to believe the future looks bright. So you, if you've heard about me saying this mission to you, we're on a mission to get a million people to wear this gear. And this is what we're doing. If you buy one of these hats, there's a category of buying one hat, getting the second one free. If you haven't yet worn this gear publicly, go ahead and test it out. Buy some of the gear, wear it in public, and see how many people will stop by and say, you're also, you also watch a value team? You, you also follow PBD Podcast? I do too. Place your order. Go to vtmerch.com. Click on the link above or below. Place your order and represent the VT and the PBD podcast gear. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.